Man, what a great day. Yeah, this is beautiful. This is going to be nice to get all this stuff done. We got to get this, get about 50 centibars of vacuum on this. We'll get a nice soil solution sample. And we'll all right, cruising. so you're all set? Yeah, pretty much. Pretty all right, much. I'm going to go sample the other field. And don't forget class at 930. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. You no make problem. it? Yeah, I forgot my watch. I'll set my alarm. And you can find your way out of here? Yep, check this out. GPS. There's a GPS somewhere in here. Yep, I'm good to go. All right, well, I'm out of here. Oh, see you later. Thanks, Chuck. Tie that beast off. Oh man. Hmm. She doesn't take forever. Uh, I'll grade some papers. Well, I suppose I should grade some papers, use up some time. Let's see. Man, I gotta stop giving essays. This is ridiculous. I know. Hey. B? C. D. Oh, too bad. Those are the F's. Well, I don't know why the TAs complain so much. Grading's easy. I better get back to the experiment. Oh, this is taking forever. Actually, it's quite soothing. I have to have a course like this. Time is it? My goodness, I'm I'm late for lecture. I gotta get to lecture. This is I've never missed a lecture. Where the heck am I? Ah, oh, the GPS will get me to the truck. Yeah. Oh man, no signal. The willow is not that. It's an e trex ah, What am I gonna do? I got. I gotta get. I gotta get to the truck. This thing's a piece of garbage. Damn it all! I gotta get to lecture. The soil water stuff's really important. This is. This damn willow is so thick. Why do they plant it so thick? Two double rows. This is insane. Man, I just can't believe it. This is nuts. I can never, can never been late for lecture. Never. Man, I gotta get there. My, my TAs, I've, I've never disappointed these guys. This, man, I've never let them down, never been late, and I yell at them when they're late. What am I gonna do now? This is incredible. Man, ah, oh, man, this is ridiculous. I'm gonna quit doing these experiments, and this, this is just too thick. I'm so freaking late. What the heck am I gonna do? I'm never gonna make it. They're called, yeah. Come on, pick up. What are you doing? Sleeping? You're supposed to be the TA. Good Lord. Come on. Hey, yeah, Lydia, listen. I'm real. I'm stuck out here. It's freezing cold. It's miserable. I've been doing working this high density stuff, trying to collect soil solution, and I'm, I'm just not gonna not gonna make lecture. You're gonna, gonna have to show a clip. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm free. Do me a favor too. Um, send food. It's ah oh, man, I'm hungry. Uh, oh yeah, chicken wings. Yeah, extra spicy. Yeah, okay, hurry up. Man, it's ridiculous out here. And make sure you get that on. Thanks. Oh, God, I hate teaching. Good morning, FOR 345. I'm here in a secret underground bunker. Since I am now getting in the results of the lab reports, I need protection. But I'll be servicing later when I get back. Actually, I'm at the soil science meeting and uh, delivering this to you in our wonderful underground studio, live on ESF campus. So today, we're gonna talk about soil erosion. Uh, we're gonna continue on, we're gonna finish up a little water. So a few things to tell you. Uh, this week's indoor lab is soil water. It is not in B13 Marshall. It's in 145 Baker for the Monday and Wednesday section. And it's in Tuesday and Thursday, 300 Bray for those sections. And again, the times are 1245 to 140 for the Monday, Wednesday, and 1230 to two for
for the Tuesday, Thursday. You should be able to pretty much complete this lab on your own. Um, this, these TAs will be there at these times for you so that there is some assistance for any questions you may have. It kind of follows from all the things we talked about in Monday's lecture and Wednesday's lecture, so it should be fairly straightforward. There's a test Wednesday, the 19th. It's in the classroom. I'll see you there. Again, no calculators, no books, no nothing on your desk but pencils. Keep everything below, and I'll have a, we'll have that test Wednesday. And a soil mapping lab is due this week, and then next week we'll see what goes on. Okay, so where are we? We have been talking about water flow, and we said water flows in response to a gradient. And we talked about saturated flow. We introduced you to Darcy's Law, which you probably heard about in hydrology. And then we talked about unsaturated flow in the Vado zone. And we talked about the gradients. And we pick up there kind of at the end and talking a little bit more about soil moisture. So let's look at moisture. So here is a, a conceptual look at moisture by volume. And here's 36%. And so we have this imaginary cube. Well, not imaginary. It's one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter. It's, um, you can see the water is occupying about 36% of this volume, uh, and that's the rest of that is uh, air, space, and soil. So that's, that's showing you what 36% moisture looks like conceptually in a volume basis. Okay? And remember, I stressed that we used volumetric basis in our soil moisture characteristic curves. And the reason for that will become more apparent as we go along and think about this moisture by volume. So let's compare a couple of soils. Let's look at organic soils and let's look at mineral soils. Okay? So consider a peat. And a peat has a low bulk density. We said that earlier when we talked about bulk density that organic soils had bulk densities in the range of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. They're at the very top of the chart on our bulk density list. So here we have an example of a bulk density of 0 0.2 megagrams per cubic meter. You have the moisture content by weight, gravimetric moisture content, 180%. You say, wow, that's a lot. But you think that's, that's a lot, but it's not so much because we have a very light medium and water is kind of heavy. So let's continue on with this idea. Okay. So let's compare that to a silt loam. Okay. So a silt loam has a bulk density of about 1.2. Here's a typical number for a surface A horizon in a silt loam soil, 1.2 megagram per cubic meter. Uh, quite a bit heavier than organic soils, but typical for what we see for a mineral soil of this texture for a surface soil. And let's look at the moisture content by weight, 30%. Okay, so if, if immediately looking at that, you say, which one has a greater moisture content? If we're looking at this moisture content by weight, this gravimetric method, we talk about 30% versus 180%. Big difference in numbers. But let's see and take that a little further and kind of explore that. Okay. What's the moisture content by volume? What's the moisture content by volume? Well, in order to get that, we need to know that the moisture content by volume is the product of moisture content by weight and bulk density. Okay. Now, when we, get bulk, when we get moisture content, we have a variety of ways of measuring it. Okay? And there's a different, we have different reasons to measure bulk density for moisture content. There are different costs. There are, some are destructive, some are non-destructive. Um, and when I talk about destructive, what I mean is that this, you destroy the sample. So if I go to the field and bring home a sample, I can't go back and sample that. A non-destructive way to measure it is to use some kind of instrument where I can put that instrument in the ground, take a reading and come back. I can go back to that same point. So we'll think about this as an important consideration if we're going to have any kind of study or following bulk soil moisture in the field. Um, if we're going to follow things over time, it behooves us maybe not to destroy the sample or the place we're sampling. So let's look at neutron scattering. So here's a method of here is a method of measurement that uses radiation. And essentially, it re measures the, reti the return rate of neutrons. And there are two things that will slow down neutrons. One of those is water, and the other is organic matter. So with that little bit, it's pretty clear to see that for this method, you wouldn't want to use this in organic soil because organic matter plays such a role. But in mineral soil, we use this method. And it's quite accurate and fairly uh, it's expensive to begin with. And it also has to deal with radiation concerns. Nevertheless, it it's works over the range of soil potentials from 0 to 1,500, minus 1,500 kilopascals. It is very accurate, and, and it's, uh, it's non-destructive. We actually put this, see that unit down here on the, on the left? Okay, this is inserted down a hole, the actually access tubing. So it's inserted directly below ground. This thing sends out neutrons. 
Uh, neutrons bounce back, and in this scale, reads converted directly to a volumetric moisture percent. Well, and that's pretty, um, pretty standard, uh, pretty expensive, and you have to, when you finally get rid of this thing, you have to worry about decommissioning it, because now you have a radioactive source and has some headaches with it. But it's a very accurate way to do it, and for non-destructive sampling, um, it's, it's a method of choice. A time domain reflectometry <coughs> called TDR. So this is also fairly accurate. But in this, a, a pulse is sent down a wave, and the rate of return of that wave is proportional to soil moisture. It's actually uh, very accurate and actually pretty expensive. Some of these units can be ten, five or $10,000. But when you have this measurement unit, these, are, these bars are pretty cheap, and you can buy these for fairly cheap. Its investment is in, in the software and in the, uh, the unit that does the processing the TDR, but it's very accurate over the entire range of soil moisture potential, zero to minus 10,000 kilopascals. And it's uh, one of the more commonly things used today in research. Okay. Capacitance, uh, here is where we use capacitance. Again, this, this uh, capacitance sends a wave down and measures, the, measures capacitance, kind of electrical signal. And this is less expensive than TDR and not too different in the accuracy and across the wide range of soil moisture conditions, zero to minus 1,500 kilopascals, it's accurately used. And it's, a, it's again, non-destructive and, and very useful. So if you're following moisture over time, this is a, this is a pretty good way to do it. Yeah. Oh, resistance blocks. So these are actually a little less accurate. And here's, uh, we're looking at something showing the resistance and its relation to the soil matrix potential, which translates to soil water. And these things are interesting because they are what they say, they're gypsum blocks with wires in them, and then we measure the current that passes through these blocks. And the thing is that gypsum dissolves over time. So sometimes you'll start out with a block that's, a, that's five or six centimeters, and it dissolves over two or three years in acid soil. And so you can imagine that that's not very good in terms of reproducible reading. So over time, the, reading, the quality declines. Also, the calibration can be different. And here, this shows some calibrations for the manufacturer's curve compared to uh, some experiments done by a variety of researchers. And see, it, this really tells you that if you're going to use this thing, you can't rely on the manufacturer's calibration. You actually have to do the calibration yourself. So a calibration involves actually measuring the soil moisture gravimetrically. And by gravimetrically, I mean by weight. You take a soil moisture uh, sample. you during that in the lab, dry the sample, measure the difference between the wet and dry, and divide that by the dry weight. So a standard way to measure. Okay. Here's a resistance block, looks, another look at it. And you can see here's this gypsum block. It's, um, it's actually protected in a small metal case. And here's the unit. And these are actually fairly cheap. But again, the accuracy is very limited. Um, not something for research quality, but maybe for irrigation needs quality. And the range is pretty high, minus 90 to minus 1,500 kilopascals. But again, the accuracy is very limited. It's kind of you get what you pay for. Okay. Here's a tensiometer. So a tensiometer measures potential. And essentially, the bottom of this tensiometer is a tip. And it's shown here. This is a ceramic tip. And it collects, allows water to pass through. This is connected and with a water column in a plexiglass column and the vacuum gauge attached. And so the soil moisture potential comes in equilibrium. The moisture moves in and out of this, and that produces a vacuum. And you read the tension, soil moisture tension, or actually soil moisture potential directly. So this is only useful in the range not too far off from field capacity and in the moist range. Once you get into very dry soil, it doesn't work. What happens is the column of water kind of becomes discontinuous as air gets in here. So therefore, it's only useful at these fairly high potentials, 0 to minus 85 kilopascals. Um, again, useful for irrigation, but when you get to soils that get drier than, um, than 100 kilopascals, uh, it gets a little difficult. Here's something. Uh, this is used for dry soils. A lot of times for, um, it's destructive because you bring the sample in, a thermocouple psychrometer. So this measures uh, what happens to the um, humidity above the soil. And it's actually a little bit of current comes here, passes through, and changes the uh, evaporates the soil, it measures the dew point. So it's, it's very accurate, but it's used in very dry soils. Um, and it, again, it's destructive. You have to bring the sample in. Okay. Here's the pressure membrane. And this is, a, this is a gadget we used in terms of getting the 
the uh, higher potentials so that we can get our soil moisture characteristics. So remember the soil moisture characteristics, we have soil moisture content volumetric plotted by soil moisture potential. To get those high potentials, uh, we need to actually use pressure. So we'll set soil samples on this ceramic plate. This seals up like a big pressure cooker. We pump in inert nitrogen gas at the, uh, p at the pressure that we want to measure the potential at. So for our wilting point, we'll pump in nitrogen gas at 15 bars of pressure. That pressure will force the water out that's um, held below that, below that tension. And voila, th that comes in equilibrium. And now we take the soil sample out and dry it. We actually have the moisture content when the soil moisture potential is minus 15 bars because we've used 15 bars of pressure to equilibrate with that. So this is used to get the higher ends of, or the low ends of soil moisture on the soil moisture characteristics. And here's a picture of it it's set up in our lab. It actually has a compressor. And this, in fact, we've not used nitrogen on this. We've used compressed air. Compressed air is pushed in. And after it equilibrates overnight, come in, draw the sample out, measure the moisture. So let's go back to our organic versus mineral soil. And we're looking at moisture content by weight versus moisture content by volume. So moisture, we've talked about volumetric moisture content and not so much about moisture content by weight. Okay. So moisture content by weight is the difference between the wet soil and dry soil, okay, or the amount of moisture divided by the dry soil. So it's essentially evaporating the water out of the soil. So here we have our silt loam example, 1.2 megagrams per cubic meter. The wet soil is 13 grams, the dry soil is 10 grams. Okay, we have our peat example, the peat is 0.2 megagrams per cubic meter bulk density. The wet soil is 28 grams, the dry soil is 10 grams. Okay, two very different soil samples. Okay. Let's compute moisture content by weight and moisture content by volume for both. Okay. Okay. Moisture content by weight is 13 grams minus 10 grams. Okay, so that's 3 grams divided by dry soil weight, 10 grams. So 3 over 10 is 30%. So this is 30% moisture content by weight, the silt loam. Okay. What is the moisture content by volume? Okay. Let's think about the peat. 0.2 grams, 28 grams, 10 grams. Okay, let's do the moisture content by weight of the peat. Wet soil minus dry soil over dry soil times 100. 28 grams minus 10 grams equals 18 grams. 18 grams divided by the dry soil weight, 18 over 10 is 1.8, okay, or multiply that times 100, 180%. So we have 180% versus 30%, moisture content by weight. Let me see if I can annotate that. Pen, hmm, probably not easily, okay? So remember that, 30%, 180%, big difference. Let's compute the moisture content by volume. How do you do that? Okay, we said moisture content by volume is the product of moisture content by weight times bulk density. Okay. Oops, don't want to do that yet. Okay. So if we take 30% and we multiply that by 1.2, well, how much is that? 36. So the moisture content by volume is 36%. Okay. Let's do the same thing for the peat. We said it was 180%. Take 180% times the bulk density. 0.2, okay. and that is how much? 36%. So these two soils have the same moisture content by volume, 36%. Note the big difference in moisture content by weight. We have 36 versus 180, 30 versus 180. Okay, big difference. So that, that's the take home message here, is that one, you need to be able to calculate this, and two, this is the reason why we compare moisture content on a volume basis when we're developing soil moisture characteristics. Okay, okay having digested that, I think that's about all we'll have for soil water, and we can begin soil erosion. So here's a little farewell that I wrote to soil water in the spirit of some of the texts, some of the books I used to read to my kids when they were small. The storm starts when the drops start dropping. When the drops stop dropping, 
the storm starts stopping. Anybody recognize the author of that? And if you had memories of your years of two and three and four, you would have recognized Dr. Seuss. And that brings us to the end of soil water. So we've covered quite a bit. We've gone all the way from the water distribution, how it's used, to how it moves in the soil, how it's stored and retained through available water. We took you through the soil moisture characteristic. And finally, we ended up with some devices used to measure soil moisture. Okay. And ended, ultimately, we came up with the conclusion that the volume metric soil moisture is pretty important for comparing soils because organic matter and bulk density makes such a big difference. And that is a good place to lead into soil erosion now that we have a good understanding of water movement because a lot of, at least in the east, a lot of the, soil, the story of soil erosion has to do with water, not so much in the Midwest as we'll see. So let's put this in the bigger context. Think about what erosion does. And someone's thought about that. Stu Pimentel down at Cornell in 1995 and a bunch of colleagues wrote an author, or authored a paper called The Environmental Economic Costs of Soil Erosion. And this was in Science. Of course, Science is one of our premier journals. And so this, this paper kind of made a big splash and generated a lot of discussion. And the, the upshot of those, some of the key points raised in that paper were numbers. So what Pimentel and others had done, they had gone through the literature, scoured the available literature for data, numbers, showing what the erosion estimates were across the planet. And after doing that, these are the numbers they came up with. It said 75 billion tons a year are removed by erosion based on scavenging the literature. Okay. And in the terms of land abandonment, about 12 million hectares per year of arable land are abandoned. A lot of some subsistence agriculture, um, areas where the soil is worn out um, for a variety of reasons, land is abandoned. And if you total that up, at least to what they had come up with, 12 million hectares of arable land per year. And think about, try to put that in the context of what's needed. So if you calculate the amount of land area needed to produce enough food, fiber, and ecosystem services for individuals, on the average, you're looking at about a half a hectare per person. Okay? And that, that's this average figure. And in terms of what's available at the time this was written, it was about half of that. So already we're starting kind of a negative balance of being able to produce enough food, fiber, and water for folks. Okay? In 40 years from now, that's projected to go in half again. So this is a declining resource base, okay, and sir, in, in light of increasing population. So it, it paints a rather dim picture of, of the future. And looking at currently, looking at figures of malnourishment, what the current situation is, um, Pimentel note that about 20% of the world's population is malnourished. That's about a billion people that are <coughs> way underneath the amount of food needed. And then start thinking about that in terms of soil loss. And so thinking on the other side of that, erosion rate estimates, and I put estimates in capital letters because these are indeed estimates. Asia, Africa, figures that Stu and others came up with 30 to 40 megagrams per hectare per year. Remember, mega is 10 to the 6. Okay, so these are pretty high erosion rates. In the US, they claim to be 17 megagrams per hectare per year. A fraction of this, but still uh, rather large. And uh, that, of course, generated a lot of controversy. These are kind of in your face numbers. So a couple issues of science later, Croissant and then Trimble and Croissant wrote a couple of articles. And they noted that these figures were really inflated. Um, they said they were way too high. Um, and one of the big criticisms was the number for the US published in USDA was about 12 or 13 megagrams, and that this was, this was high by about 40 or 50 percent too high. Yeah. And these, these two art papers were also published in science. So, Trimble and Croissant really, really hammered this and said that this literature view was, was inadequate and that these numbers were too spectacular and poorly put together. And the, the point being that even if these numbers are off by a factor of two or three, they're still very large and so they're, they're still very worrisome. And it, it still paints a bleak picture even if the numbers are off. So that's the, the context for erosion. We have a decreasing land base, we have an increasing population, and it, it's, it's a sensitive subject when we start degrading the, the lands that are going to produce food and fiber for these increasing, increasing mouths to feed. It's just, the two things just don't mix. And so now we'll, we have this context, we'll focus on erosion, we'll talk about the process and what it is. Okay. 
So erosion is, we usually think about erosion, but we have two kinds of erosion. We have accelerated erosion. Okay? So accelerated erosion, this is in response to human disturbance. This is man, human caused, person caused. Okay? And the other side of that is natural erosion or geologic erosion. So in the absence of human activities, there's erosion occurs naturally, and it occurs over, over landscapes over millions of years. Landscapes are uplifted, they degrade, uh, and things erode. But that's, that's natural erosion. So the thing that we worry about accelerating that is, is the worrisome thing, kind of deplete these soil resources by some, in response to what we have done. So someone um, had looked at the impacts of humans on the flux of terrestrial sediment in the global coastal ocean. This is a pretty interesting paper. Uh, it has some interesting figures in it because it puts some more things into perspective. And they looked at global estimates of erosion and they looked at seasonal sediment flux. That is, they looked at seasonal sediment flux that's leaving fields and ending up in dams and so forth, ending up in waterways. Okay? And they compared modern versus pre-human conditions. So for pre-human conditions, they utilized some watersheds that were uh, largely forested and with very low populations and compared those to modern, uh, some modern watersheds. So in terms of sediment transport, they estimated the global sediment transport increased by about 2.3 billion tons per year. Okay, so every year we get this increase of 2.3 because of sediment transport. There's a lot of stuff moving. If they look at the sediment reaching the coast, that's been decreasing by 1.4 billion tons per year. Okay. So, um, and here's where, where's it all going? So um, about 100 billion tons or more are sequestered in reservoirs. So all this material is eroding, but it's, it's filling in reservoirs. It's not leaving, uh, it's not ending up in the ocean. Okay. And what happens? Coastal erosion. So in response, uh, the coast, the waves erode coast, and things are, things are quite messy. So that's an interesting way to think about it, is all this soil moving and, and uh, creating a problem in terms of reservoirs. And so, of course, those reservoirs have to be dredged. And all that material doesn't make it to the coast, right? Normally, all that material, erosion material, flows out to the coast and builds up continental margins. But now it's not happening. All that material is kind of being held in reservoirs. And it, it, creates, a, it creates for some interesting problems. And that's another kind of way of thinking about erosion and some of the negative impacts. So let's talk about erosion itself. It's a process. So when we talk about erosion, we're talking about a process that has several steps. And the first of those is detachment. Particles are detached. Okay. The second step is transport. So it's erosion itself, it's just moving the particle, is not, it's detached and then transported. Now there are two agents, the wind and water. And in the eastern United States, where we have a lot of precipitation and excess of evapotranspiration, Water is the primary mode of, of erosion. As you get more to the drier parts of the southwest, where the rainfall dissipates, then wind becomes more of a problem. But both of these are problematic. Both of these agents transport soil particles that have been detached. And finally, there's a third piece of that, deposition. Okay, so that somewhere, somehow, that material ends up where it really is out of place. So when we talk about erosion, we're talking about the process of detachment, transport, and deposition. That's what erosion is. It's all three of those things together. Okay? That's, it's this process that contains all three elements. Now, we spent a lot of time in the earlier lectures talking about weathering. And what is weathering? You know what weathering is? Weathering is the biogeochemical wearing down and physical wearing down of, of rocks and minerals. Okay, and they come to smaller pieces physically, and they also become transformed biogeochemically. Okay, that's not erosion, that's weathering. These are two very different processes. Erosion is the detachment, transport, and deposition. Very different than weathering, which is this biophysical, biogeochemical, physical mechanism that reduces particle size and alters their, their chemistry. So what are the mechanics? Let's first look at water erosion. Okay, so here's detachment, and it's a picture in the book, figure 1710, and this shows actually the impact of, of a water droplet and actually detaching soil. It's a rather nice shot, 
and shows a spectacular detachment of soil particles. And, and so we have this continual splashing and detachment. Okay? So that, that's just the first part. Now, water erosion can be divided into several components, and so we think about three types. And the first is sheet erosion. Okay? And a sheet is just, just as it sounds like sheets of soil, maybe only a millimeter or two millimeters thick. This is exaggerated in the vertical section. Sheets of soil are moved from complete fields. And this is, while it's not very spectacular and noticeable, it's uh, insidious, this is the big problem, sheet and rill erosion. One of, the, one of the outcomes or one of the results of sheet erosion is sometimes these pedestals, so where rocks will sit on a, where rocks will protect the soil surface, the sheet erosion will occur around these rocks and you get these rock pedestals and it's, it's pretty neat. Here's an example, a picture of a rock pedestal. You can see the stones and this is maybe a millimeter or two th very thin, but you take that over a whole field and this ends up to be a very large amount of soil coming off. Okay, so we have sheet erosion. Now, rill erosion are miniature gullies, very small gullies, rills. Okay? And so these almost like rivulets. And here's a nice picture from the, the text showing the farm. So you see these little tiny miniature rivulets or miniature gullies all flowing down. That's rill erosion. Okay? Now, normally when you think of erosion, we think, we think of the more spectacular. We think of gully erosion, okay? these spectacular gullies. Okay? And there's, there's plenty of those. And the reason we think about them, because they are visually spectacular, and they're very noticeable on the landscape. Where this is very noticeable, the sheet erosion is, is hardly noticeable. But over the, over the years, the real impact of erosion, it's sheet and rill erosion responsible for the great deal of problem. The gully erosion looks pretty spectacular, but in terms of relative volume of material move, it's sheet and rill erosion that account for the most of it. So now we have this conceptual model of erosion. Let's try and quantify a little bit. There are three models that are used to predict erosion. WEP, the Water Shed Erosion Prediction Project, Universal Soil Loss Equation, usually, and Revised Universal Soil Loss Equation. So these are the three most common models used to predict erosion. And it turns out that these two are even more commonly used. And we'll kind of we'll describe those. And so why have this? Well, it's important to be able to estimate the amount of erosion because if we're doing something to resist erosion and we have some kind of, some kind of management practice that'll resist erosion, it'd be useful to be able to quantify that. Okay? Because some of these processes can be very devastating and on the other side, it may be costly to fix or to, re to repair. So we'll start with WEP being first on the list, the Water Erosion Prediction Project, WEP. So WEP is a simulation model, okay, and simulation, and that's the key. So it's a daily time step, sometimes on hourly. So on a daily time step, it's a rather complex model. Okay. So it predicts raindrop impact, predicts splash erosion, interrill flow, that is the flow between the rills, the formation of rills, channelized flow, gully formation, and sediment deposition. Okay. So that, that's an awfully detailed model. And you can imagine that the parameters required to predict this are not easy to measure themselves. Okay. Very, very complex model, and we're doing it on a time so da daily, okay. sometimes even hourly. So this is, this is a simulation model that runs, uh, takes a little bit of computer time and a lot of data, a lot of parameters. Here's one example. Okay. So this model divides the soil surface into rill and interrill areas. Okay. So the rill components, the chain dg dx, and that's equal to the interrill and the rill erosion. Okay. So we've got this model, here's this equation, here's the sediment delivery, kilograms per a second per meter squared. Okay. And we have this interrill sediment delivery and the between the rills. So this, is, this itself, this one small piece of the model is fairly complex. Okay. And this is just the rill component. Okay. The inner rail component is computed by this, um, this K, G, C, S, and so these are constants. So we have a real detachment deposition rate. Okay. K is a constant depending on the soil, um, soil resistance to erosion. Okay. We have canopy cover. Okay. So the important thing to remember 
is this is a process-based model, a daily time step, okay, process-based. We're trying to develop these processes, predict the amount of soil that's going to move within the rill and between the rill based on a number of factors, all that are very difficult to quantify. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to contrast that with the water erosion model called USLY, or the universal soil loss equation. Okay. So the universal soil loss equation is quite different. So here we have going to predict average annual long-term sheet and rill erosion from crop loss, cropland. Okay, so look at the difference. Average annual long-term sheet and rill loss from cropland. Okay. And I put those in capital letters because I want you to remember that. The average annual long-term. So it's average over a year, it's average over a long-term, and it's sheet and rill erosion. And this is by water. Okay, this is the amount of soil that's moved on a field. It may not move off of the field, okay, but it's re some, it could be redistributed, some it'll move off, but it's the amount of soil that moves on a field. Okay, it may be off the field, it may get water, it may not. Okay. Two big differences. So if we go back here, look at the difference between this process model, this daily time step. Here we're looking at a real component, inner real component. Okay. We're looking at some very difficult to parameterize um, pieces. Okay. And we're doing this on a daily basis and adding them up. Okay. Big difference. Average annual long term back to Usley. Okay. Okay. Now in the 1980s, uh, a couple of authors modified this. And so this long term average annual sheet and real erosion loss model was modified for forest lands. And there's a whole paper uh, by Dissemeyer Foster, and if you're interested, you can actually get all these individual equations, and it's a pretty useful paper if you ever do any work in erosion. So here it is. It's an empirical model, okay, an empirical model. That is, it's made by numbers and, and made by scientists using some guesses and some modeling, some numbers to try to predict based on what's been observed in the past. And here's the model. Soil loss in A, soil loss, and that's expressed originally in tons per acre. Okay, soil loss in tons per acre. A is equal to Rickle skip. R K L S C P. So here's a model that's the product of six factors. R K L S C P. A is equal to Rickle skip. Now we'll look at each of these factors, and I'll ask you to remember this because these are primarily the factors that impact erosion, and we have now a way to quantify them. Okay. Soil loss in tons per acre, average annual long-term sheet and rill erosion. It's an empirical model. The data for this were obtained from plots all over the United States and put in by the USDA on these standard plots. And after that, stirred up the data and tried to find out what are the factors that varied among those plots that allowed them to contribute to estimate soil loss. Okay, let's go through the factors. Our rainfall erosivity. So this is a factor with the numbers from less than 10 to 700. Okay. And it's a function of drop size and intensity. So the greater the drop size and intensity, the greater this number. So it's not just the total rainfall, it's the intensity and the distribution. If I have a two or three inch storm in one, or if I take that two or three inches and then put it over five days, there's a very different impact, a very different effect. So we have actually calculated, or scientists have calculated this R factor. Okay. And it's based on climatological stations across the US and here it is. Okay? So you'll see some very high factors down here in Florida in the hundreds, and then you go out here in the, in the dry, arid southwest, and you're close to zero, 10, very small rainfall factors. So where you have high intensity rainfall in the east, and as the rainfall intensity increases, you go to the southeast, these numbers get very larger. So simply using this model, you can pluck this number off these isopleths from any spot in the US, and then you have the R factor. Rainfall intensity. Okay, next is a factor called K, soil erodibility. And erodibility is this resistance to erosion, and it's computed based on infiltration capacity, structural stability. And these are collected for all the soil series in the United States by the USDA. So the USDA estimates K for all the soil series in the United States. Uh, there you can get it from a table or some of their databases based on their infiltration capacity and structural stability and involves soil texture. 
So how are all these numbers come from? So originally, all these plots were put over the US, and these plots are all standard, 22 meters long with a 9% slope and fallow. And fallow means um, not plowed, or not, not cropped. And, and so at the end of all these years, every year, they would measure the amount of sediment coming off these plots. And based on their location, they developed this model, R A is equal to Rickle skip, and those are the factors that were able to allow them to explain most of the variation in soil erosion loss. So uh, these are all 23 meters plots, about 9% slope, and fallow. So what do those numbers look like? They range from 0 to 0.1. Okay? So they have an effect, could have a, could it, with no soil erodibility, there'd be no erosion. Okay? So as the number increases, the erosion increases. So here's our Bath flaggy silt loam. We are on the Marden Volusia Chippewa Catena. Bath is the shallow to bedrock part of that. So a Bath flaggy silt loam, 0 0.007 is the K factor. For a Cecil sandy clay loam, this is in the southeast, Cecil sandy clay loam, 0 0.048. So each of the soil series has a number associated with it that's been calculated. So we have R and K. Let's go on to S. So S and L refer to the topographic factor. There are two factors combined, and we collectively refer to this as a topographic factor. And it ranges in terms of the number from 0.2 to 20. And L is a slope length in feet or meters, and S is the slope gradient. Okay, so this LS factor accounts for the slope length and the slope gradient, 5% slope, 10% slope, etc. And here's a table showing that. So as you increase the slope length, the LS factor, the slope length and the gradient, the LS factor increases. So these can be obtained either from graphs or from tables, and that LS factor is fairly easy, um, fairly easy to get. All you need to know is the slope length and the slope gradient. And voila, you plug that into the equation. And this illustration is shown on page 757 in the text. Then we move on to C. So we're, we're at the Rickles, now we're at C, and C represents cover management factor. And so this is a concept or it expresses the ratio of the loss under cover for that unit plot to no cover. Okay? So if you have no cover, no cover factor, there's no canopy, um, the factor is equal to 1. There's no reduction. If you have 90% forest canopy with 100% linear, the reduction is 1,000-fold. It's 0 .001. So this relative factor shows a tremendous impact of having a canopy cover with forest litter relative to an open fallow field. That's pretty astounding. And here's an illustration. Here we have different values of cover okay, for ground cover. And we go from pretty close to zero all the way up to, all the way up to 100. So here we have 100% cover. So 100% cover has a very low uh, C factor. And as that cover, so here's an illustration of cover across the surface for litter. As that cover of litter and roots dissipates, the C factor goes up tremendously. So there are a variety of ways to estimate that. And again, these can be done from tables and nomographs that are available from the USDA. Also, in this case, available in the text. And the last is P. So we complete Rickle skip. How is it that soil scientists are hooked on phonics again? So if you remember A is equal to Rickle skip, you'll remember this. And P is the support practice factor. And these are a variety of those shown in table 17.8. But just like the C factor, this expresses the ratio of the loss with the practice compared to without it. Okay? And for P is equal to 1, there is no practice, and there's a reduction, and P gets smaller and smaller. So what are some practices? Here is contour strip plowing. Okay, so this, this, these fields are cultivated across the contour and also in strips. So there's living vegetation in between the harvested. So contour strip plowing. Here's a, actually, I took this over a flight around Skinny Outs Lake Watershed. Okay, so you can see the strips and you can see the, the harvest areas and the vegetated strips in between. So you can imagine this has a tremendous impact because water flows down gradient, downhill, by gravity, so as water from these harvested flows with sediment here, all that sediment settles out. So essentially, this really breaks up the slope length. 
So instead of a long slope, all of a sudden the vegetation stops the material and the sediment loss is reduced tremendously. So here are some examples. Here's a percent slope, one to two, for in contour stripping, and it shows the, the change in the C factor. Okay? Here's contour st strip, and, so that, and here's um, one to two percent slope. The effect of contour plowing and then strips with contours further reduces it. So instead of one, we have 0.25. Here's a 75 percent reduction in soil erosion on a one to two percent slope when you do both contours and strip. And the reduction changes as the, as the slope increases, the impacts of, re, of erosion are greater. Here we have 0.5, and here we have 0.9. So the impacts of contour plowing on a very steep slope are less than on a shallow, shallow slope. But the use of the strip with the contour plowing reduces that by about half. Okay. So what do we do? There's other ways to to uh, conserve soil, and one of those called conservation tillage systems. So the idea behind conservation tillage systems is to maintain cover and minimize mechanical tillage. And we do this, it involves a couple of things. If you're going to maintain cover and minimize mechanical, you have to be able to hit the weed somehow, and so there's a lot more use of chemical weed control. And the second part is that seeds are actually planted in residue. So rather than clean cropping and have it make it look like a typical cornfield that's completely barren, there is plant residue, and the seeds of the next crop are planted right in the residue. This maintains a greater cover. And of course, we've already seen with the, with the cover factor that that can have a tremendous positive impact on the reduction of erosion. And here are some illustrations, some results of conservation tillage that show the impacts and the reduction of erosion. Okay, so we have conventional tillage versus uh, no-till, and we see a tremendous reduction in the amount of soil that's moved. Okay? And there's not much change in runoff, so that's a real important factor. So there are a lot of data, there are a lot of data that show the positive impacts of minimum tillage, no-till systems. And that's been a tremendous success in the last 10 and 20 years. Here's an example of a, uh, one of these plows, mole bore plows that turns a V-shaped subsoiler. So this will, subsoil gets it deep into the plow, and so you're seeing that it doesn't turn over the whole field. Here's a chisel plow. So we talked about plow pans, and the chisel plow is a deep plow, and able to go a little deeper, but it also leaves some space in between the chisels. And here's the culprit. This is the mold board plow. So here's a complete uh, complete tillage, the soil is completely overturned and everything's left barren. So this is the, this is the standard of plowing and against which all these other no-till or minimum tillage things are, are measured. So the mold board is, is pretty much a, a completely cleared system and that's what we're trying to reduce at this point in time. Here's a slide and strip. So here this is a plow that just has strips. It leaves vegetation in between the strips and the seeds are planted right in the row. So again, the cover is maintained in between the strips, increasing that cover factor. Here's no-till. This is where the, material, the seeds of the nest crop are planted right in the residue of the old crop. And you can see the germinating seeds here. And this is even better because all this is left undisturbed. The cover factor is very high. The reduction in sediment losses is, is tremendously reduced by this practice. Here's an illustration of what happens with mold board plow. So this is a couple years ago uh, next to the Richards, uh, next to the Shotwell Brook. And here we're looking at a typical cornfield, mold board plowed. And the, this is just a very slight slope, maybe about a 3% slope, but look at the soil buildup here. So this is a buffer strip, it's a vegetated buffer strip, but tremendous soil movement from this completely cleared area. And so one of the problems, Shotwell Brook feeds skinny atlas lake directly and it's, the brook is close to the intake pipes and so sedimentation here creates havoc for the skinny atlas water system. So that was improved, that we improved that or Ed NRCS and Onondaga County Soil Water Conservation District went to a no-till system and the buffer uh, grew up to be a little bit better, sediment re reduced tremendously and now it looks like this. And the Shotwell buffer after no-till in 2006, uh, a tremendous improvement. 
And here we are looking at another view. So we said this is all, um, all grown up. All this is now undisturbed. And the sediment has effectively been stopped by this no-till. So here we have a picture post-2006. And another shot. So it's pretty, uh, pretty apparent that this no-till and the buffers have an incredible impact on sediment reduction. And I've shown it visually here. Um, it's been shown by lots of numbers in terms of sediment movement for a variety of studies uh, across the U.S. Now, we've talked about mostly universal soil loss equation, USLE. That was revised. It was improved uh, not too long ago, and it's called a revised universal soil loss equation. So we've gone from usely to roosley. Okay? And, and so the factors are the same. They're both models used RKLSCP there has been some refinement. So in the R factor, in the revised, sediment, revised universal soil loss equation, there's been a greater number of weather stations. So that allowed the refinement of the R factor, okay, a little more accurate. For the cave value, this erosivity, soil erosivity, it formerly was based on texture and organic matter and permeability, okay, and USLE. Well, in the revised universal soil loss equations, those factors have been adjusted for seasonally for freeze and thaw. So crops grow and expand and freeze thaw. So actually, this has improved the accuracy of this uh, factor. This slope length factor, that's been adjusted for the ratio of rill to interrill erosion. And you recognize that from some of the wet model. The cover factor, C, has been adjusted for on a 15-day rotation. So now it's just not one cover factor. It's based on crop growth, and crops develop over time. And the Erosion, uh, the protection factor, that's been increased or improved by adding hydrologic soil groups. So the hydrologic soil groups involved um, uh, are ratings by the USDA in terms of hydrologic soils that contribute to wetlands. Okay. So that brings us to wind erosion. Okay. And it's probably, it's probably a good place to stop and take stock of what we've talked about. Okay. So we've gone through the process of Water erosion, we've put erosion in the big context, and, and we've looked at its, fact, its, uh, its impacts globally and even locally in terms of river basins. We said that those impacts were rather large. Then we defined the process of erosion, detachment, transport, deposition, all three of those. And then we looked at some ways to model it. We identified a rather complex model, the wet model, that was a daily simulation model. We looked at an empirical model, the universal soil loss equation that was average annual long-term loss prediction. And we looked at the revised universal soil loss equation model. All of those water models looking at pretty much sheet and real erosion and their impacts, their estimations. I guess we'll leave for next time, we'll leave wind erosion. We now have enough information to think about BMPs in terms of water in this past week. We visit the BMPs. So as you think about these models, um, and we go through them in the next lecture, think about their relationship to best manager practices and how we might quantify the impacts of best manager practices on soil erosion loss. And with that, I leave you, and I will see you when I return from the soil science meeting. Hope you have a good week and do well on the test, and I hopefully have those graded within a week of return. See you next time.